Bell joint pops. And repeat after me. I take refuge in the Buddha. I take refuge in the Dharma. I take refuge in the Sangha. Keeping the palms joined. Put the palms down. Good evening, everybody. Good to see you all here. Um, yeah, a lot of uh, people have asked recently, um, I always do the offerings to the main shrine here. And then recently for a while now, I've been turning that way so i get the question of you know like what's that <laughs> very simply and uh this is uh, medicine buddha uh, tanka and very often you see the medicine buddha in the lapis lazuli the, the blue color um, holding the medicinal um, jar a jar with medicine and uh you know this practice and good evening to everybody online here um this practice is uh, initially it starts with with us, you know, our pain, our suffering, um, our challenges, our difficulties, our joys, our happiness, you know, the highs and lows that we experience throughout our lives. And even just today, um, I'm sure you had moments throughout the day that maybe were a better moment than another moment. And then you had a moment throughout the day that Maybe it was a, a lower moment than other moments. Um, but so that's kind of our days is these, you know, highs and lows. And uh, so we start with just this recognition of where we are at. And we do experience a lot of, a lot of pain throughout our lives. And so for me, really since this uh, pandemic has started and just this piling and piling of, of things seemingly more so than normal even though it's it's really not more than normal it's just being um, amplified on a an extreme level right now but with the pandemic with things in ukraine with shootings in texas you know there's so many things right now um that people's hearts are just like breaking and uh emotionally physically mentally uh, you know, there's just, there's just so much pain right now. And so for me, a while back, I started to also just turn and, and do an offering to the medicine Buddha. Um, and for those who are completely unfamiliar with offerings or anything like that, just, you know, kind of a Western context, think of them as like a prayer, you know, you have someone you pray to or something like that. So this is very much what that is. Um, it's like a prayer for health, a prayer for healing, uh, not just for us, but for everybody. Um, when you look at this practice, you really, well, you can look at it however you want, but you really can't explore Buddhist practice without recognizing that there's a, a collective consciousness and 
a world filled with humans and other sentient beings around us that are also experiencing pain and suffering and highs and lows. And um, so for me as a practitioner, it's always helped to just stop and recognize that this practice isn't uh, just about me, you know, very rarely, and it was the same case for me, but very rarely do people come into Buddhist practice or meditation simply because they want life to be better for somebody else. Right? I mean, did any of you show up here thinking like, I'm here because I want to make sure someone else's life is better? Not usually. But as you begin to practice and you begin to recognize really what this path is about, you begin to see that, yes, it starts with, with us, but it really does have a pretty drastic impact on everybody around us. And so that intention, those thoughts, those prayers that uh, we send out is, is important and a reminder to recognize that it's about so much more than just us. Um, so uh, to all of our hundreds of thousands of YouTube followers. I got tired of saying a million, so I'll drop it down to hundreds of thousands. Um, welcome, good evening, thanks for joining us wherever you are. Feel free to chime in, say hello, introduce yourself, um, chat with others, only nice things, of course. Um, so we'll start with the meditation practice. Uh, there's a couple things I'll tell you before we begin, especially for those who might be new. Uh, nothing's gonna happen to you, you won't float away. You're not going to have any mystical, magical experiences. A mind that races all day long is not going to shut off. Don't judge your practice, meaning don't ask yourself, is this working or not working? Am I doing it right or wrong? Uh, we're just going to sit. We're going to breathe. You'll hear sound. Sounds inside. Sounds outside. This is life. Life is filled with chaos. And uh, this practice is learning to get quiet and still within all of the chaos. Posture, you want to be comfortable. If you are on a cushion or on a chair, bench often helps slide into the front third. Pushing the stomach forward allows the back to straighten. Shoulders are relaxed. Hands can be on the knees or in the lap, whatever is comfortable. I will guide us as we begin. We'll settle into a little bit of silence. Most important, do not expect anything from this practice. We're just going to sit and breathe. And starting with the eyes closed, if comfortable, or slightly open. Mouth is open or closed. We'll start with taking three deep breaths, slowly. And eventually, settle into a natural rhythm of the breath. Noticing the mind as it wanders. Jumping from thought to thought.
We'll start with gently guiding the attention, focus to the stomach or chest. Breathing in, feel them rise. Breathing out, they fall. Simply continue this practice. Observing sensation of breath. Expecting nothing but to sit and breathe. As the mind wanders, lost in thought, recognize it, release that thought, return attention, focus to the breath.
letting go of expectations, letting go of judgment from the practice, just sitting, breathing. Breathing in, follow breath in, breathing out, follow breath out.
keeping the mind alert. Aware of each sound. Each thought. each physical sensation yet concern with nothing but sitting, breathing, with the body still rested and the speech quiet aware of all sounds and the mind learning to settle Know what it's like to just sit and breathe. Knowing with each breath, there's nothing else to do. Nowhere else to go. no one else to be. Everything beautiful, exactly as it is. Sitting, breathing, Once again, 
Taking three deep breaths, slowly. As you slowly open the eyes, slowly beginning to move. And most important, with the practice of meditation, is to recognize how you feel now, immediately after. Compare this to how you typically feel throughout your day. Recognize the difference, if there is one. Ask yourselves how you'd prefer to feel every day for the rest of your life. And realize however you feel now, if it's quiet, calm, and still, or a busy mind, racing mind, Whatever you're sitting with at this moment, it's nothing to do with anything I said. It's nothing to do with how we sit and hold the hands across the legs. It's nothing to do with the sounds around us or anything else for that matter. It has everything to do with your own mind and your own mind's reaction to an external condition. This is what the Buddha called Pratitya Samupata means dependent origination. This is the basis of the Buddha's awakening. The word Buddha simply means awakened. He was a human being no different than any one of us who began to understand why he suffered, why he got angry, sad, depressed, stressed, anxious. He began to understand the causal relationship of all phenomena. And what that means very simple for all of us Regardless of where you come from or what you believe in or where you think you're going, your whole life is filled with things that happen. You react. More stuff happens. More reactions. That's it. This practice is learning what it's like to respond to something quietly, peacefully, still. Because for most of us, the way we responded to the last 20 minutes is quite different from how we respond to everything else that's happening throughout your days. And so all we're working on is closing the gap to where the way you feel now is closer to how you feel always. Just as driven, motivated, productive, successful, whatever that means to you in your respective lives. But with a mind that's steady, clear, focused, distracted by nothing, disturbed by no one, this practice is not easy. It's not necessarily fun. It's not an escape, as often people think it is. It is direct perception into the present moment. And very often that present moment is incredibly difficult. And so this practice gives us an opportunity to wake up to 
each moment as it arises. To be with life as it is. Not holding on to all our expectations. Not holding on to all of our cravings and all of the ideas of how we want things to be. Not holding on to all of our past regrets and resentments and frustrations and disappointments. Recognizing that all of those things are a part of our journey. And this practice is waking up to where we are right now. Sitting and breathing. Learning to be with that as it is. It sounds so simple just to sit and breathe. But it's the mind that makes it so difficult. The sitting and breathing part is just happening. We don't have to control that or force that or do anything. We just show up. But the real question is, what did your mind do for the last 20 minutes? Anyone else have about 7 million thoughts? Right? Some of them pleasant, some of them unpleasant, and some of them neutral. That's what the Buddha taught. Pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral thoughts. And that is our entire existence, every moment of our entire life. And so once we work on surrendering this idea that we're going to fix and change and control so many things and people and places around us, and we work on learning to be with life as it occurs, things get simpler. Ultimately, nothing changes except our mind's perception of a present moment. And if we can change our mind's perception of a present moment, then our entire reality changes. And if our entire reality changes, then we have the ability to enjoy life and be pleasant. There's a great text, the Dhammapada, and the first line says, mind is the forerunner of all evil. That's the English translation. I'm not actually a huge fan of the word evil, just because of the way evil kind of comes across in the English language. But the essence is the mind is the thing that messes us up. Right? And, uh, we create our thoughts. Anyone been angry about something for like 10 years? <laughs> right. How's that working for you, Mitch? Not good. 10 years? How long? I always start at 10. I want to keep it, you know, a simple number. I mean, a, a low number. When did the thing happen? I don't need details. But... The thing that popped into your head when I said anyone been angry about for 10 years, how long ago did that happen? This family stuff when I was young. Okay. And is there anything at all that you can do to change any of that? No. Yet here you are, and it still tortures you. Right? This is life. This sucks. Buddhist practice will not take that away, it will not make it easier. It won't change anything that occurred. It doesn't even make it okay. And again, that's also for people who might be new thinking that like Buddhist practice puts some pretty little bow on everything. Like, no, it doesn't say that whatever that is or whatever we're all sitting with right now, Buddhist practice doesn't come along and say, well, that's okay. That's just what happened. No, it's not. It sucks and it hurts and it destroys us. But it happened a long time ago. And when our mind fixates on it and stays there, that's when we experience that pain and that trauma over and over and over again. And that's where it becomes so difficult to live in the present moment because we're so fixated on the past. 
And again, just for those who don't know me, I'm not a therapist. I don't want to get into that. And there is place in therapy to process all of that. And a lot of that stuff is incredibly helpful and beneficial. And, uh, you know, most people who come here have probably gone through all of that. Right. Or a lot of people who come here, I should say. So there are places for that to process that. Definitely. For me, the Buddhist practice is to recognize this is what occurred. And if I continue to carry the anger and resentment and hatred in my heart, then there is no space for compassion and love and forgiveness. So it's a practice. It's not an easy one. I wish it was. Meditation is free. Buddhist practice is free. It's just sitting, breathing, becoming aware of what you think, what you say, and what you do every moment. And the more mindful we become of what we think and what we say and what we do, the more gentler and kind our thoughts can become. And if we have gentler, kinder thoughts towards ourselves and towards others, then the side effect from that is we may feel more pleasant but it's a, it's a practice. Uh, so with that, um, I'll pause. Uh, I always really prefer just to respond to questions, uh, meditation, Buddhist practice, um, anything that's on your mind, and I'll use the rest of our brief time this evening to address that. And again, um, for all of you on uh, YouTube here, thanks for joining. There's a chat box there somewhere on your screen. Feel free to type in questions um, and I can respond to you as well. So I'll just open up to questions. Yeah. I don't have so much anger with the past as I do fear of the future. Ah. And, and while I know there's a part that I cannot change, it doesn't assuage my fear. Correct. Um, yeah, so just to repeat, to, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I don't know how to make it a question. But. Yeah, no, that's all right. There's, there's a thousand questions in that statement. I just want to paraphrase it back for those virtually that didn't hear it potentially. Um, what you said was you don't know so much that you have a question, um, but it's not the anger from the past that gets you. It's the fear of the future. Yeah. Um, I hear you. And the good news, oh, he's got to start with good news, right? <laughs> yeah, you know, I see even under the mask, I can see you smiling. It's always in the eyes, you know, the eyes kind of light up. Um, the good news is the way that you overcome anger from the past is the exact same way that you overcome fear from the future. That's the good news. Now, let me ask you this. I'm glad that you don't have anger from the past. But in your past, have you ever been angry? Sure. Sure. And in your past, obviously, this is kind of a silly question, but have you had things that made you angry? Sure. Sure. But you're not angry anymore from them. Right. Why not? Well, I, I can't say the anger is all gone. Okay, well, <laughs> I wasn't even getting into that. That wasn't even my point, but thanks for opening up that can of worms, right? Well, let's just say, let's just continue on with my, you know, my fun theory here. What I was suggesting or getting towards, and I just wanted to hear you kind of play this out, is that very often if we don't have a lot of anger that we're carrying from the past, that means we're not looking at it. It doesn't mean it didn't occur. That's why I asked you if you had anger in the past, if you had things occur, right? Without looking on it, can you see what's up on the wall behind you? No, I just said without looking at it. <laughs> slowly or not. <laughs> I liked how you tried to slowly look behind you, though. Can you see what's on the wall behind you without looking at it? Not very clear. Not, no, not very clear. Not at all. <laughs> you can't at all. Why can't you? Because it's behind you. Now, can you see what's in front of you up here? 
You can. Why? It's before your open eyes. And you know what else is before your open eyes? All the stuff in the future that doesn't even exist in the present moment. So it's not even the eyes. It's the mind. It's our mind's inability to stay present. So when I say moving beyond anger and things from the past is the same, you know, the way you overcome that is the same way that you overcome fear of the future is by training the mind. And this is the biggest, like it's everything I say is like the biggest, but this is one of the biggest things that people miss within Buddhist practice. Mind training, training the mind to be present is the practice. It is not about, well, I want to learn about Buddhism and I want you to tell me, I'm not suggesting saying this, and I want you to tell me that everything's going to be okay. It's not. You know what's going to happen in the future? We're going to age, we're going to get sick, and we're going to die. Every single one of us in this room. That is truth. Cannot escape that is what the Buddha taught. The question is, how can we work with that? How can we embrace that? And how can we do that without being terrified of everything? You already know the end game. The end game is we're going to die. Take that out of the question. Have you accepted that? Uh Uh-huh or uh uh-uh? I do personally accept it. Okay. Have you accepted that you're going to age? Meaning literally every second you're getting older. Yes, I do. Have you accepted that at some point most likely you will get ill? It's true. All of those things. So if you know that is coming, right, and you can really embrace that, why waste any moment being afraid of anything? There's an acronym I learned years ago for fear, false evidence appearing real. I don't know if you ever heard that, but I heard that years ago, and I just thought it was really beautiful. False evidence appearing real. So many people live in so much fear for the future, and yet you don't even know if you're going to get back to your car right now. Training the mind is critical. Training it to do what? Abide in sensation of breath. When your mind is in the present moment, if you're focused on the present moment, what are you not focused on? Future. Future. Anger, stress, anxiety, it's all in the past. Oh, why did this happen to me? You know, family, drama, childhood, trauma, you know, relationship issues, whatever it might be, everything from the past is where anger, sadness, depression lies. And we could spend your entire day kicking yourself to death, wondering why all these things happen to us. And once we finish that list after about three years, our mind jumps to the future. Stress, anxiety, fear, worry is all in the future. So the training of the mind is learning to be present. Here I am sitting, breathing. Does that fix anything? No. It doesn't change the past, and it doesn't, I mean, it does, but it doesn't, in in the ways that you're thinking about it, change the future. It just allows you to focus on present moment. Train the mind, fear goes away. You ever been afraid of something that actually worked out better than you thought? You ever had that happen? So fear can destroy you. I know you realize that. I'm pointing out the obvious. But train the mind. That's that's the simple um, teaching. Spend nothing but every moment the rest of your life staying in the present moment, and you'll be good. Sound good? 
You ever seen the movie Being There, the old Peter Sellers movie? Many years ago. Watch it again now that we've had this uh, thing. See what happens when you stay fully present. Yeah. I don't know if that's helpful at all, but yeah. Other questions? Yeah. I'm entirely new. Like Me I'm too. <laughs> uh, can you explain the significance of the different, like I heard you talk about the medicine for that. Yeah. Um, and I didn't realize there was, there was a difference. I thought that it was just through that. Yes. Yes. So the question is, you're, for again, those virtually, you're entirely brand new. And can I explain the difference in the Buddhas? You didn't realize there was the medicine Buddha. And so my question to you is, do you think the dude with the big belly, you think that's the Buddha? Uh, uh, I, I honestly don't know. I just want to get into this because I just like talking to me. Yeah. So I, I'm not sure. I don't know. I just want to get into this. For sure. No, no. Great question. Um, the reason I say that is a lot of people who are brand new, and for the last 15 years, that's a lot of what we see is people who are brand new to Buddhism. And they often think that the big belly dude at the casino, that that's the Buddha. And this is kind of like finding out, there's no kids here, right? This is kind of like finding out Santa Claus isn't real. That guy is not the Buddha. The dude with the big belly, his name is Hotai. He was a monk in China about a thousand years ago. Very lucky, very prosperous, always had a bag of stuff he would carry around and give it out to people. Sound familiar, right? His name is Hotai. Literally means bag carrier. So that Buddha, as we call him, in the Western culture, became known as the happy Buddha, the lucky Buddha. And so you see him everywhere. You rub the belly for good luck. Not the Buddha. I'm just starting there, right? Um, because that's the image that you'll see predominantly everywhere is, is that guy, right? So then to back up and give you kind of the brief story, uh, the Buddha was a human. He was a prince. He lived 2,500 years ago, so 500 years before Christ. And I'll give you all like the two-minute version of the life of the Buddha. And his father was a king. That's what made him a prince. Um, he was, for 29 years, he was sheltered. Uh, when he was born, it was predicted that he would either become uh, a great king or a great, like an enlightened one, a Buddha. And so the father wanted him to be a king. The mother wanted him to be, you know, a Buddha, um, an awakened one. But they sheltered him, and at 29 years old, he snuck out in the middle of the night, and he saw old age, sickness, and death, is what I was referring to. And he saw an ascetic, a very simple, kind of like a nun or a monk, simple person. And he said to his buddy, Chana, like, yo, what is this old age, sickness, death stuff? Does that happen to all of us? And they said, yeah, we're all going to age, we're all going to get sick, we're all going to die. And at that time, in India, 500 years before Christ, they all believed in rebirth. And he said, well, I don't want to keep being reborn if all we're going to do is age sick and die. I want to escape that. I want to figure out how to stop myself from being reborn. But forget about the rebirth part for a minute because it's completely irrelevant, sort of. Um, and so 29 years old, he left, uh, snuck out in the middle of the night, roamed the base of the Himalayan mountains for six years. And at 35 years old, he sat under the Bodhi tree in Bodhgai, India. And he said, I'm not leaving until I figure out why we suffer. And he began to understand that all suffering came from his own mind. And at that time, actually right above you, above Travis on the door, that image right there, there were five guys that were traveling with him. And for those six years, they kind of, they were yogis, they were ascetics. They thought that they could starve themselves to death, you know, you know, starve themselves to overcome attachment to physical body. They almost starved themselves to death. And that's actually one of the Buddhas up here is the emaciated, emaciated Buddha. So he sits under this Bodhi tree for 21 days and he understands that we suffer because of our own mind. Those five guys came back and he taught the Four Noble Truths. It's the first teaching. And they are, life is filled with suffering. Discomfort, angst, dissatisfaction that our entire life we're going to suffer. Doesn't mean all of life sucks, it just means you're going to suffer a lot. And most people, if you're here on a Tuesday night, you've already figured that out, right? Uh, the second thing he taught is what's the cause? The causes are greed, our anger, and our ignorance. We always want more. We're angry at the way things are, and we're ignoring truth, meaning we see the world how we perceive it as opposed to how it actually is. 
So he said, we overcome greed with generosity. We overcome anger with compassion. We overcome ignorance with wisdom. Third noble truth is that there's an ending to suffering. That's the good news. Nirvana, liberation, freedom from suffering. And the fourth noble truth is the path. And that's called the Eightfold Path. And he taught the correct views, thought, speech, action, livelihood, effort, mindfulness, concentration. This is, in essence, without getting into that right now, this is our karma. This is how we live our lives. This is how we, what we think, what we say, and what we do. And where our mind is and how we move through the world. So he taught these things to those five guys. And then he roamed for 45 years teaching the exact same thing and other stuff. But that's where it all started from. And in 80, he died. So back to your question about like all these other Buddhas, right? So that is what we call the historical Buddha. Shakyamuni, um, Siddhartha Gautama was his name, the prince. But you have an Indian cosmology. You have like endless world systems. Again, I'm not going to get into that, um, mainly because I've never studied much of it. So it's always easy to say I'm not going to get into it. But you have endless world systems beyond this world system that we're in. Right? But our Buddha is Shakyamuni Buddha, and he was just a dude. No different than any of us in here. Then you have what's called bodhisattvas. You have like medicine Buddhas, you have bodhisattvas of compassion. These are enlightened beings. The big statue up here in the middle is Kuan Yin. Her name means hearer of the world's cries. So she hears all the suffering in the world and pours out endless compassion to heal, right? Here you have another bodhisattva named uh, Samantapadra. This is the great uh, bodhisattva of diligence to work hard. The six tusks represent the, what's called the paramitas, uh, Six perfections to overcome suffering of generosity, morality, patience, diligence, concentration, wisdom. And over here you have a Bodhisattva Manjushri. This is the Buddhist practice of ultimate wisdom. So he sits on a lion. You know, you ever been in a cage with a crazy lion? Neither have I, right? It doesn't sound fun, but taming the crazy lion in a cage is um, what it's like to tame our own mind. And so here he sits just playfully on this little crazy lion. So because Buddhism, when the Buddha died in India, and then maybe over the first 100, 200 years, it goes south, Thailand, Laos, Vietnam, Cambodia. Five, 600 years later, it goes up north, China, Japan, Korea. Um, and then 1,000 years ago, it makes its way into Tibet. So and maybe over 100 years ago, really a lot, the last 60, 70 years, Buddhism comes into the US, you know, Europe, Canada. But because you have one thing, that spread for 2,500 years into different cultures and different countries, you have different images that went along with it. So you could have literally the exact same Buddha, like Shakyamuni Buddha, Siddhartha, and you'll see him depicted in like 20 different ways. And that's more of just an artistic design based on how the culture represents. Does that make sense? Is that like an interpretation? Yes. Yeah, I mean, it would have been really easy to just say that there are different interpretations, but I figured since you're new, I'd give you some background to it. Yeah. So, yeah. And it can be confusing, you know? Definitely. Good. So, thank you. Other thoughts or questions? There's a question here on the subject of staying present. What do you think about planning for future, though? Sometimes the anxiety comes from having to plan for the future to make progress in your life. Yeah, it's a great question and, and um, absolutely true. You know, it's important to understand that, you know, all of us Buddhist people talk about staying present, staying present, staying present. But, I mean, I had to plan to be here right now, right? I mean, there's a schedule. It says seven o'clock Tuesday. I prepared my day to be able to sit here. So the practice is not to just like abandon having no, you know, all of your plans or life goals or objectives or things like that. You want to work hard. And you can have plans. You can have goals. You can have expectations. Those aren't necessarily wrong or bad. But the question is, what happens when they're not met? How do you react to them? That's the real challenge. There's nothing wrong with having goals to do well in life. The Buddhist practice is not to just like 
drop out of everything and throw in the towel and give up. It's to engage, really, but with kindness and compassion. And very specifically, the question around um, the anxiety, yes, I understand that the anxiety comes from the, the planning for the future. But again, very often we're planning so far ahead and we haven't even like gone to bed yet. And uh, there are people who will go to bed tonight and not wake up tomorrow. So plan all you want, but recognize that, you know, tomorrow's promise to nobody. And I don't see any benefit in making yourself miserable and completely anxious and stressed out trying to plan your entire life when anyone's life worked out how you expected it to this point? Nobody's, you know? And sometimes it works out better than we thought, kind of my, to my point earlier. And sometimes it works out worse. So again, for those who do deal with anxiety about future, which is incredibly common, um, you know, people who show up at places like this, it's because they're dealing with stress, anger, anxiety, sadness, and depression. That's it. I mean, it's not it, but that's a short list. So anxiety is very common. Um, plan for the future, but try not to be too attached to the outcome. Yeah, sorry. Um, I'm not sure if I got the, um, the all the iterations of Buddha. So yes. Are they all the same? And they're just different interpretations of the one being? Yes and no. It kind of, how's that for an answer for you? It kind of depends on what tradition, what lineage, what culture you're you're talking about. Um, the bodhisattvas, right? I did kind of brush over that quickly. I said these are bodhisattvas. So bodhisattvas are not considered Buddhas. Bodhi means enlightened, sattva is being. So bodhisattvas are considered enlightened beings, right? I always say they're kind of like an angel. But then the question always asks, and I know this because I used to ask this forever, like, well, are they real people, right? Historically, you'll see yes. The, again, depending on different cultures, as an example, right? The Dalai Lama, you know the Dalai Lama, yes? Maybe not personally, but you know of the Dalai Lama. They say he is the literal rebirth of the Bodhisattva Kuan Yin. And that is the reason there is this endless compassion in him. That Kuan Yin Bodhisattva, the enlightened Bodhisattva of compassion, has been reborn over and over and over again. And in the current form of rebirth is the Dalai Lama. So... Then you also have what's known as emanation bodies of the Buddha. You have um, stories of endless Buddhas and Bodhisattvas. Years ago, probably like 15 years ago or so, I used to be really big into like trying to pinpoint who they are, what they were, what they did, where they hang out, you know, what they have for lunch. And I eventually just realized None of that was relevant for me personally, because what I was focused on was trying to determine, and this is just my experience with it, like, were they real people, right? When did they live? What did they, uh, like, how did they hang out? What I eventually came to realize was, what do they represent? And that for me was a lot, um, a lot more beneficial for my practice. Instead of trying to figure out, like, where was Samantha Padra 2,000 years ago? What does Samantha Padra represent? Instead of trying to figure out where was Manjushri 2,000 years ago or where is he today? What does he represent? That's, um, for me, what I always settled on. Yeah. So, and different Buddhist traditions will give you different answers to that. Uh, and everybody's just guessing. So, because that's my point is ultimately it doesn't matter. Somebody said once years ago, if the Buddha never lived, if it was all just one big story, if it's all just one big made up story, it doesn't change. Because with Buddhist teachings, it's not like this religious thing where you're like hanging on to this word like it's gospel or something like that. It's not that. 
He wasn't a god. He didn't want you to view him as a god. He didn't want you to treat him as a god. He was just a dude. I mean, he was, you know, royalty. So, but he was just a guy. And, uh, yeah. I will close on that. We'll join palms. May the benefit of this practice be shared with all beings in all directions. May any merit gained from this practice be transferred to the more than 6 million lives that have been lost during this pandemic, their family and friends who continue to suffer, to all of those in Ukraine and surrounding areas, and those who lost lives in Texas and their family and friends. May they all be at peace and free from suffering. May we all be at peace and free from suffering. So uh, a few questions before y'all scatter. Um, thank you for being here. Uh, my name is Jeff. I'm a Dharma bum. Uh, we opened up this temple 15 years ago to introduce Buddhist practice to those who show up. Um, those of us who lead, we're not monks. We're not nuns. We're not gurus. We're not masters. We're not teachers. We're not looking for students. We're just practitioners. Uh, we do our best to take our understanding, a very unenlightened understanding of Buddhist teachings, and we do our best to put it into terms and words that hopefully make sense to those who show up. Uh, so every night we have different practices going on, different people from different Buddhist traditions uh, sharing their approach to Buddhist practice. Um, we have a recovery sangha, um, so new battling addiction um, that meets as well. Uh, there's always something going on. The family group has restarted again. Um, so the website has the whole schedule of all that. Um, yeah, uh, Day of Silence also has returned. So it's the first uh, Saturday of the month that does require an RSVP um, because we cap it at 15 people. So it's four hours of silence. So if 20 minutes of silence isn't enough torture for you, um, then you can do it for four hours. And um, to my knowledge, most people have survived. So uh, thank you all for being here. I wish you well, be safe, um, and good luck. Thank you. Thank you all. Good to see you, everybody.